My name is Latifa Bartlett de Virio. Um, I am a program director over at Good Samaritan Ministries down the road here in Holland. So the experience that I have that I'm going to be speaking from today is working with both adults and children experiencing trauma from having unsafe partners, being in unsafe homes, um, sexual abuse, and chronic resource scarcity. Um, that is the population that I predominantly work with. And so what I do not have expertise in is, um, while I have lived experience with a lot of folks who um, arrived in the U.S. through various means and have had a chance to work with them, I do not have training and sort of professional expertise around working with individuals from non-U.S. cultures. So the reason that I am wanting to clarify this is the human brain is the human brain. Trauma is trauma, right? Physiology is physiology. However, giving a training saying like, okay, so here's um, folks that have lived in the U.S. for X number of years, or here are individuals who have grown up in the U.S. Here are some things to look for when looking at or considering nonverbal signs of distress. Those sorts of things are really different culture to culture. And so if we stay in a very US-centric frame of mind when we're thinking about nonverbals, when we're thinking about how do I make my body language welcoming, for example, um, that is not a question I'm gonna be able to answer for you with 100% accuracy. What I am gonna be able to help you do is give you a really good framework around trauma some practices that are used in the US, the US and Europe around trauma-informed interviewing. And then we are going to sort of collectively think about some questions that we may not have answers to, but that we wanna keep in mind as we encounter the new arrivals to our community. So that is what I've got, that's what I don't got, and hopefully we will figure it all out together. So here's your definition of trauma-informed interviewing. Trauma-informed interviewing involves both understanding how a traumatic experience influences the encoding, storage, and retrieval of information and memory, and recognizing that the retrieval of such a memory could itself be a traumatic experience for the interviewee. So we hear this term trauma-informed used a lot, like trauma-informed practices, trauma-informed healthcare, trauma-informed education. And what that often means is that we're gonna say, we recognize that trauma has long-term impacts on people. We want to create <coughs> systems and structures and interpersonal behaviors that recognize that and account for it, but also remains very strength-based, very asset-based, and does not fall into this deficit-based model. But when we look specifically at interviewing, we're gonna be really concerned about when we're asking questions, how does trauma affect the way that people tell us their stories? How does having to think about and sort of rifle through your memory to pull up some of these experiences, answering questions about them, change the way that they may that someone may interact with you, or how free they may feel in sharing that information? So that's really what we're going to be focusing in on today. Um, because I only have 45 minutes, this whole part about encoding, storing, and retrieving information, you're not going to get cool pictures of the brain for that, but just like it happens, and if you want books about it, that's a very cool thing to read about. So this first page is a little bit about some of the more like clinical terminology about what to expect. So bullet point one, a lack of chronological linearity and the omission of details from the narrative. What that means is telling a story A to B to C to D, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and here are all the details that went with each of those pieces. That can be very disrupted when someone is trying to retrieve that memory and share it with you um, for a variety of reasons. But if someone does not remember a detail and remembers it later, or they have details the first time and later they're not able to pull that forth when they're talking to someone else, that is not a sign of dishonesty. A lot of people are like, oh, those details didn't match. They probably made something up. That is not what that indicates. That is an indication that human memory around details can be very, very tricky, especially when there's trauma involved. Um, and also, the human brain and trauma, when it comes to that kind of information, is not super consistent. This person here can have almost no detailed recall because of the trauma and the other person can have it seared into their mind and they can't forget a detail even though they're really, really trying to. Um, both of those are real experiences. Um, so 
for those of us who are interviewing, um, interacting, whether it's at this first page or later on as we're just neighbors and we're hearing people's stories, right? As we're, as we're living together in community, being aware that we're not bringing certain expectations of how people will share their journey with us is I think really helpful. This is sort of a good practice, but interviewers should watch for nonverbal and emotional signs of re-experiencing the traumatic event, including lack of eye contact, being physically closed off, and extreme variations in affect. I'm gonna say that first one, um, including lack of eye contact. This is one of those ones that is used frequently in these kinds of training and is also very specific to cultures. There's lots of places that making eye contact with someone that is older than you is considered disrespectful. Holding eye contact too long could be considered sort of a challenge. Um, making contact with uh, eye contact with someone of a different gender may be considered inappropriate. So if someone is avoiding eye contact with you, again, not a sign of dishonesty, and it also may not be a sign of distress. That may be just a very typical cultural way of interacting with eye contact. I will say extreme variations in affect. Um, so being very, very sad, then very, very blank faced, very, very angry, just very that, that using a lot of varies, that rapid cycling. Um, that can mean that someone is either in distress, like they could say, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm feeling overwhelmed, or they may not be able to articulate it, but as someone who is watching, interviewing, that may be a time for you to say, okay, what we need is a chance to pause regulate and re-enter. Trying to push through that, maybe like, okay, we've got to get through it, and we have this very limited time that may be necessary in some cases, but where possible, giving space, allowing the, the body and the mind to come out of that place of feeling threat in, a, in an acute sense might be the best move. Um, and the influence of stress and emotion on the brain are complex and multifaceted leading at times to the enhancement of memory and at other times to the disruption of encoding and retrieval processes. So as I mentioned before, every person is going to be very, very different in this regard. And in the 90 minutes that we get with someone, that is probably not something we're going to be able to figure out. So we are going to do our best to approach every interview with this awareness, but not a set and rigid expectation. So challenges in cross-cultural communication. Um, I've put easy to overcompensate here because this is my personal weakness, um, not just in cross-cultural communication, but when I want to make someone feel welcome and at ease, I have a tendency to be a bit of a Labrador, right? So I come in, I'm so excited to meet you, and I've got huge smiles, and I'm just, I want my body language to be warm and inviting. And that can be really overwhelming and a little bit scary if you don't know what to do with that. Um, if that's not typical for you, if that's not culturally normative for you, um, that's just a lot, right? That can be intense. So that um, impulse of, oh, I just, I want to come and grab their hand and pump it in a handshake. I just want to just tell them how happy I am. Like, it's a lot, guys. So my suggestion for that is going to be aim for what is warm, but also calm. So enthusiasm is valuable and maybe long-term as relationships develop in the community, it can be great. But in this first space, coming across as calm and collected and predictable is probably what is going to help people feel more at ease and like you are a safer person than that overabundance of emotion. I also want to bring up some challenges in self-management. Um, so one of these is implicit bias. Right? So implicit bias, if you're familiar with the term, is the idea that our brains are pattern matching machines. They have taken what we've been exposed to before and they're always looking in the environment around us to say, what is this closest to? What is this closest to? But our brain only knows what we've fed it. So lots of stereotypes that we've seen in media, if we have sort of these like very selective experiences with a population or a group, that is what our brain is trying to pattern match against. Um, it does not mean that you are hateful or malicious or that you wish ill on anyone, but it does mean that when you see someone who talks a certain way, dresses a certain way, carries themselves a certain way, um, your brain is trying to match a pattern that is going to be existing in, we call it a subconscious. 
So this is like that moment of like, check yourself. Be aware and be honest that we are just carrying expectations into every interaction. And um, in a second, I'm going to describe the horn and halo effect. And I want to connect and think about how does the way that we ask people for their stories, the way that we gather information from them, get affected by the um, implicit bias that we might be carrying? One question. Hey, David, when do I need my pause button? 15 minutes. Okay, I, you guys, I don't want to take a pause. I'm just going to keep rolling. Okay. The horn and halo effect is actually um, a really interesting cognitive bias, which just means it is a quirk of our brains, a, a tendency that it has, which is if you have an impression of someone um, as positive or negative, it overly influences um, your thoughts about their character, their competence, and things like that. So for example, you walk into a room, you see someone who's at a meeting table at work in their pajamas, and you see someone at a, that same meeting table in a suit. Be just based on that, they haven't said anything, they haven't made their presentations, you, you know, haven't gone out to coffee with either of them. Just from that, do you think that your brain is going to say, hmm, I think I know which one of these people knows what they're talking about, right? Um, now, I would say I love someone in pajamas giving presentations to me, but that is something that I'm fighting against my brain's natural pattern matching to say, ah, that person in the suit, probably, they're the real professional here. I use that as an example because I think most of us have that similar cultural coding, right? But what if when I see that sort of thing, that gets stuck in my mind, I'm like, wow, whenever that person tells me something, I'm going to weigh that as something I should listen to and to con take into consideration and have it impact my work, and this is how I want to guide my department, because person in the suit said it to me. And when pajama person gives me their advice or their feedback, I've already set in my mind this horn effect, right? halo and horn, this horn effect of this is not a person that I see as competent. And so I'm not consciously, but I'm subconsciously undercutting all of the information that they give me in my brain, right? Halo and horn, someone comes in and you see something about their body language or something about the way that they are talking to another person and maybe they're nervous, but our brain pattern matches that as angry or combative. When they're telling us their story and when they're answering questions, are we giving them the benefit of the doubt? Are we seeing the best in them? Or is our cognition having a bias to put people in a box and then think about, are they in a category where they are believed? Are they in a category where we're giving them the breaks and the time that they need to process their feelings? Are we um, really leaning in and asking those clarifying questions or do we get intimidated and back away and we don't gather the information the way that we need to? That's where those implicit biases, that's where those cognitive biases kind of come into effect. And so we really have to self-monitor and be honest and say, am I treating every person with the same standard of care regardless of what I am subconsciously picking up and interpreting, especially with that extra challenging factor of cross-cultural communication. So anyone who tells you about trauma-informed interviewing, the first thing they're gonna say is establish rapport. <laughs> um, that is great advice that it can be kind of challenging to do. So establishing rapport is really this idea of how do I in a really short period of time help you see me as someone that is trustworthy, on your side, and has positive regard for you. So that can be done a lot of different ways. Um, there are often suggestions about like gestures of hospitality. So um, a glass of water, a glass of tea, um, you know, sharing those, like, those things that we call small talk that a lot of people get frustrated with. But I am not going to probably harm you if I comment on, on, on the rain and how damp we all are. But it's saying, I'm sharing a small opinion. Oh, I love the rain. Oh, I hate the rain. You know, you're, you're sharing a small piece of yourself that allows someone to see you more as a person with a clipboard and hopefully opens the door for them to share back and for you to say, oh, that's so interesting. 
It's those little kind of micro interactions almost that help build rapport. Um, if it is appropriate, sharing um, things that you have in common. So I would say like in a broader context, um, if you see someone, you know, sitting in the waiting room and they're eating a poppy seed muffin and it's time for your meeting, saying, oh my goodness, I love poppy seed muffins, but I get so embarrassed when they get stuck in my teeth. Like something small like that can just be an easy break the ice. And it's, it's about saying, I'm going, I'm about to ask you for so much information. I'm about to need you to be really vulnerable with me. And so it's almost like a small symbolic gesture of sharing and vulnerability back. That's part of what can help establish rapport. Um, empathy is obviously important, but we're going to dig into that on one of the other slides. Clearly articulating what to expect. This is so important. When someone arrives in the office here, we have no idea what the last several months or last several years of their lives have been like. We don't know how many times they've had to change environments. We don't know how many people they've had to tell their story to. That is gonna be a blank slate to us. So one, I would say that we can all be on the same page that saying anyone who walks into Lighthouse to have an engagement with a volunteer or a staff member, we want them to feel as safe as we can make them feel to be as welcomed as we can make them feel and to allow them to walk away from that feeling a sense of hope and not hopelessness, right? So every interaction, every single volunteer contact, every staff contact, that's what we're hoping people experience, right? So when I say, here's what is going to happen in the next X number of minutes, I am going to ask you these questions. <clears throat> The infor this is how I'm going to use the information. So there may be a better script that the staff specifically has for you, but some things that I might recommend considering would be, I'm going to ask you some questions, and it may be about information that feels scary to talk about or that may feel dangerous to talk about, but the information you give me is going to go straight to your lawyer. It is not going to go from this form to anywhere outside this building, and even things that you feel like might get you in trouble, that's information that your lawyer needs to have to help take care of your case. So please feel as comfortable as possible telling me those things. And if you have any questions, I'm going to have breaks throughout the process where I'm going to say, please ask me your questions now so you know when is a good time to ask questions. Now that is not actually to say the rest of the time is bad to ask questions, but just say, ask me questions anytime. That can feel open-ended and overwhelming, and even something like that can be like, oh, what if I get this interviewer mad at me? What if that's disrespectful? What if that's too pushy? So clearly delineating things like, this is the question break, please ask your questions now, is creating those space, right? It's those little things that you're like, wow, when it all pieces together, this feels like a much smoother experience. Um, the articulating what to expect, what I did say about the confidential and information is true. Um, I don't know if you guys have gotten a link yet to the interview form, but some of those questions are going to feel like, oh my gosh, what if this gets me in trouble? What if this is the thing that gets me kicked out? And so really reassuring people and encouraging them, this information needs to be known by your lawyer so that they can help you with your case. We just really have to lean into that. One more thing about this page is encouraging continued recall. So it is really easy to give people examples, right? I do it all the time. So someone's like, I don't know what that means. You're like, oh, so if you had gone through this, you could answer this way, right? And we're like, oh, that's a really useful example. They, now they have a clear picture of what I'm talking about. It is also really easy to create sort of the subject, not subjectivity, that's a weird word. It's easy to lead people into thinking they know what we want them to say. If someone's like, oh, I know what they want me to say. They're looking for me to say this. They want me to affirm this. Um, people in precarious positions, and this is not just talking about refugees, this is talking about anyone that you're interviewing that feels vulnerable or precarious. If they think they know what you want, there is a high likelihood they're going to try to give it to you because you are part of their pathway to safety and stability and resources. And so being aware of your position, position in that conversation, because you're coming in, you're a volunteer, you're welcoming, you want all these good things. 
it may not feel like you're in a position of power, but it is very likely that you are being perceived as being in a position of power. And being thoughtful about that with how we word our questions, not unintentionally suggesting they move in one direction or another with their answers, very valuable. Um, and then if we go back, if you remember the point about um, the circular or nonlinear storytelling, again, one, this idea of linear storytelling being the most natural is again a very like US European way of thinking about storytelling. There's lots of cultures whose like broad storytelling base is a more what's called a circular narrative instead of a linear narrative. So like there may be some of that anyways. But especially if we've got any kind of compromise of memory recall, um, you're going to see a much more disjointed storytelling. So asking someone, what happened next? Okay, well this happened, but then what happened? Even trying to give those like little prompts can be, oh wait, I don't remember which order that happened in. You can see someone getting kind of like frustrated or like confused of like, wait, I thought. Even just saying, okay, what else happened? tell me more about is much more open-ended and I think that that can be more helpful and feel less overwhelming when you're asking people questions. Best practices. Do not ask compound or rapid-fire questions. So I'm actually pulling up some questions from the um, interview form that the interviewers, like the interviewing volunteers will be using <laughs> that are phrased as compounds. And we're going to look at like, let's not ask these as compound questions. Um, so saying, can you tell me when and how and who was with you? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We're breaking that up. That's going to be one question each, and they're going to have time to think about it and answer you and have a pause after without you rushing on to the next question. That's going to be, that's good for everybody. Don't we all prefer to answer questions that way? But especially for someone that is in emotional distress or has experienced trauma, that's going to be really, really valuable. Um, also, be comfortable repeating or restating questions. Um, so, I don't know if this is an experience any of you have ever had, but if you've ever been like in a hospital or, or gone to a doctor and you've gotten really bad news, or like a loved one has gotten really bad news, that moment, those hours, even sometimes days afterwards, where you're like, my head was underwater. I do not remember anything that these people said they said to me. All these instructions the doctor gave to me, I couldn't recall any of them if you paid me money. That sense, like that's, that's like that sort of small moment of your brain experiencing a trauma or preparing for a trauma. And so when you think about that, if you've ever been through it, think about that on a much wider and, and sometimes longer scale. And what does that mean if you're trying to recall or answer questions while you're in that mind frame? It's very challenging. So as the interviewer, something that you can do is being comfortable with repeating questions or restating them. And there are even some of the questions on the form that'll have like a prompt of this can be restated, right? Making sure you're still getting the correct information, but don't be afraid or feel like what is written here is the only correct way to ask this. And if they don't understand it, well, I guess we're just marking, I don't know. It's okay to think about even beyond language barriers, even beyond cross-cultural communication, for anyone, it's just like, what is a different angle to come at this communication-wise that helps them sort of grab onto and give me the core of the information we actually need to know? I know I mentioned this earlier, but this idea of clarity of cues. So saying, it is your turn to ask questions now versus, do you have any questions? Um, now it is time to take a break. Would you like to stay in the room or take five minutes in the lobby outside if it's not snowing, you know, something like that, of instead of saying, would you like to take a break? This might feel strange because you're like, wow, we're about giving people agency. We want them to have choices. We don't want them to feel powerless. But in a lot of these situations, when someone is feeling uncertain or unsafe, that idea of I have to make this choice. I have to guess which one the interviewer wants me to do. I don't want to make anyone upset that can actually be harder. So in these cases, being more directive can actually be more helpful while still staying in that space of letting people have choice and agency. Before we move on to the next more specific portion, what are some thoughts that you guys are having to the first kind of pieces of what I've shared? I, I can completely relate with the whole cultural um, difference 
this, you know, Hispanic background and being born in the United States, it's so, I cannot stress how much of, even like me just being able to go back and forth English and Spanish, and it's hard. It's yeah. very, very challenging. Like, if you're in a setting and you're like, okay, well, how am I supposed to act here? Mm -hmm. If you're in a different setting, okay, well, this is how I'm supposed to act here. So it also, I don't know, it, I think it also plays a factor in like this whole, um, like an identity, like who really am I? Yeah. <laughs> but you're really both. Yeah. You're really both. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty cool how you were explaining it. Well, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for sharing. I do think that in a, in a broader sense, there are so many unspoken rules that govern what we do in any given space. Um, and it's interesting when you have to change not just your spoken language, but you almost have to flip that switch and change the unspoken rules that you're following in different spaces. So it's, it can be exhausting. It's very exhausting. Yeah. Are we speaking with translators? Are we speaking directly with individuals? They, so they have been instructed to, we, we don't yet have the resources to hire a translation service or anything like that, so they've been instructed to bring their own translator to their intake. So you'll be working through a translator, which is going to obviously impact a lot of this. Mm -hmm. You know, developing a rapport with someone who you're speaking to by way of a translator, yeah. you know, makes it even more challenging. Yeah. Um, but that's just the reality of working with this population. Some of these folks may already have an English base. Um, especially those people who are coming in with some of those other remedies like special immigrant visas or who uh, were former contractors for the U.S. government. They may mm -hmm. already have substantial English language uh, capability. Um, but for those who don't, they've been asked to bring in a translator. Oh, okay. Those folks we've seen so far have not, we've needed the translator very much. So. Um, so, and just so I can help with the advice that I'm going to be giving, are, are these typically professional translators they're bringing in, or like community members? It could be a community member, it could be a spouse, um, okay. not necessarily professional. Okay, so let's talk about how legitimately this is going to add some layers of thoughtfulness to what we need to do. So one thing is, if you're working with a professional translator, the recommendation is that you look at and communicate always directly to the person that you are interviewing. Um, and the translator will sort of be like the voice in the ear over here. But when this is someone's um, friend, family member, community member, um, acting as if they are invisible is not going to be recommended in <laughs> the same way. So um, engaging that person, um, doing introductions and rapport building, making sure that just in terms of like body language and eye contact, looking between faces, um, I would say is more advisable. Whereas if it was a professional translator, I would say keep your kind of body and eye language towards one person. Um, also, there are questions, for example, if you've ever experienced like intimate partner violence, if the person translating for you is the intimate partner, um, that is going to be very difficult for us to get an honest answer from. So I'm not sure what our remedy for that is going to be, depending on who the translator is, but that may be something that you want to note down um, on just like a little piece and send, like, a, and I wouldn't put that necessarily in the form. I don't know if there's a space for extra notes, but just to kind of put a sticky note saying on, translator was intimate partner, so may want to re-ask that with a different translator farther into the process, right? So there's just some thoughtfulness about that that I think could be useful. The other thing is um, it is not recommended to allow minor children to be translators for their parents. It's not healthy for family dynamics long term. Um, however, in this sort of situation, I'm not sure at what point people are going to have access to other translators. So they may bring, you know, their 15-year-old kid in with them. Um, which again is going to be difficult. A lot of the questions that we're asking are sensitive and so asking them in front of someone's child, even if it's like a teen child, they may not want to answer those fully and, and lose face or be embarrassed in front of their kid. Like that's hard. And so I would say anything like that that you guys are noting as interviewers that might be complicating make little notes like that that can be attached and so later on in the process if there is a different translator those can maybe be spruced up or re-asked um, not in front of an intimate partner not in front of a offspring 
So those would be sort of my first thoughts about how to handle us having friends, family, and community members as translators. Okay. Any more thoughts or questions about that? Because that was just off the top of my head, so if you guys have... Okay. Um, this is... Yeah. I am purely curious. Mm -hmm. But the question about can you experience uh, intimate violation or something like that? Intimate partner violence, yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of curious what relevance that has to this process. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to let this app jump in too, but my very short understanding is there are a lot of different classes or reasons why someone may be able to apply for one sort of status or another in regards. So, um, for example, if someone's been trafficked, they may be eligible to apply for a different kind of status. Um, if you have experienced um, any kind of oppression because you're attracted to same-sex individuals, right? You're like, why do they need to know this? Like, that feels like a very invasive question. Because if you've experienced certain um, things in your life, that impacts the kinds of visa or statuses that you're able to apply for. So that's actually really, I'm glad you brought, you're bringing up such great questions. So if someone asks you, well, why do you need to know that? Why are you asking? Everything that is listed on there is because it is directly relevant to helping the lawyers who will be receiving that case think about all the angles of the case and what they might be eligible for in terms of different pathways through the immigration system. Helpful? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so this is a question that I have cut and paste off of the um, interview form. And so the things that I had, this is, this is what it says. What happened in Afghanistan that made you want to leave? Question mark. So some people will tell their story in different ways. Some will require you to ask more questions because they are more guarded or have difficulty organizing their storylines. Don't be afraid to interrupt if you were not able to fully understand parts of the story. If you have questions about their story or there are logical follow-up questions, be sure to ask. So when we talk about setting expectations, something that I would say either state at the very beginning or kind of restate throughout this interview process is if I have questions or need clarification I'm going to pause you while you're telling the story so either I will say the word pause or I will hold my hand up like this and that means that I need to ask you a question about what you're saying right there so I can make notes and then I will have you continue your story right so that <laughs> That may seem you're like, oh, that feels like a little patronizing. Why would you have to say that? Because when you interrupt someone's flow or when you've stopped someone from telling their story, you can actually feel like, oh, maybe I'm telling this wrong or I'm saying this the wrong way or they didn't actually want to know about that or maybe I should just shut up. Maybe I'm just talking too much. Maybe I'm irritating them. Like there's that sense. So if you let people know, if I stop you, here's why. It's because I want to know more about your story. I need to ask a specific question, and then I will want you to continue telling me your story. So explaining that at the beginning, reminding people of it through the process is going to be more helpful. So if you think about um, all the different things that we interpret and understand, like there, <laughs> this is an example I like to use is do you ever go out to like a lake or an ocean where there's like different colored flags on the beach that tell you about like dangers in the water? Okay, I'm just getting some head nods. If not, imagine that there are flags on a beach and they're supposed to mean things. I grew up in Michigan, but like I never learned this lake language. And so if I go out to a lake and there's a yellow flag, I'm like, does that mean yellow like a traffic light? Does that mean like high UV, you're gonna get burned, hide from the sun, put on extra sunscreen? I don't know. If you see like a purple flag and you're like, okay, like I saw that at a beach and it was like dangerous algae in the water or something. I don't even know why it was purple. And I'm like, no one told me this. I don't know what this flag means. There's just something stuck there. And people then are like, well, didn't you see the flag for the undertow that was so dangerous? Why did you do such a stupid thing? And I'm like, I didn't know what the flag meant. I thought it was pretty. It was colorful. We're celebrating color day. I don't know. So you don't even know that the flags are supposed to send you symbols, much less what the colors are supposed to mean. In the same way, a lot of what you do is going to be flags on the beach. When someone is looking at you and talking to you, they don't know what you're trying to communicate. So the more that you can be specific and consistent, 
the easier it's going to go through you. And I think the more that we do this, you're going to figure out, oh, this person responded really well to this, or that worked really well for me. That's the phrasing I'm going to use every time. And it will become, I think, much smoother for you as an interviewer. Now, so these are also things that were pulled off of that interview sheet. So there's going to be a couple places where it says, if you answered yes or I'm not sure to any of the above questions, please provide a brief explanation. So you're going to click onto a sheet on the Google Doc. It's going to have a couple questions, and then it's going to say, if you answered this, this, or this, down here in this other box, it's going to be explaining it. One thing I'm going to encourage you to do is not make people tell you their stories more than once. So if you ask a question and you're like, have you ever been through this? And like, oh my gosh, yes, blah, 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 blah. Okay, they have told you the story. And you're like, okay, I've checked the box. And then you scroll down and there's like, ah, yes. If you said no, put the detail, <laughs> if you said yes, put the details here. Thinking, so your familiarity with the form, and even if you like need a printed out copy where you've got like a little flag of, if they say this, I need to be typing this in the box as, box as the answer. If they just say, yes, no, maybe, then when you get to the bottom, you're like, hey, do you remember when you said yes up there? Tell me about it now. You can do that, but if they start by saying, I'm going, like they answer and begin explaining immediately, think about how you're gonna begin noting it immediately so that when you get down to that box at the bottom of the page, you don't have to make them repeat themselves. Again, some of this stuff is not gonna be really heavy or weighty, but some of it might be. And so the less we have to make people retell their stories for us, the better. We wanna be as thoughtful and conscientious about that as possible. Um, so the two bottom ones are the example of the compound questions that I was referring to earlier. So this is one question. How is your current living situation? Who do you live with? Do you have to pay for rent and food? Are you able to come and go as you please? Do you have access to your own documents or does somebody else control them for you? Do not read this as one question. It's all written together as a question. Do not read it all as one question. So again, this is about familiarizing yourself as an interviewer and thinking about conversationally, tell me about your current living situation and just let them kind of talk and be thinking, okay, what does this match with? And if they say, oh, I live with a lot of people. Again, so on this, because we're being very thoughtful about confidentiality, you are not going to be asking for anyone's name. Oh, who do you live with? Your brother? What's his name? Jimmy Bob? No, we don't need that. We don't want it. We're not writing that down. We are focusing on like all that confidential information that can go to a lawyer. But you are thinking of this question is, um, is there something here that someone may need help with? Is there anything here that's a yellow flag or a red flag for they may be in a compromised or unsafe situation? So that's really what you're drilling down in. So conversationally, tell me about your living situation. Oh, do you live with anyone? Who do you live with? Um, do you have to pay for rent and food? Okay, um, I'm gonna ask you a little bit more about that later to see if you're having any tough times with that, but let's keep going on. So um, can you tell me if, can you come and go as you please? And if they're like, they shrug, what does that mean? Do you just leave a maybe? No, you say, okay, can, if you wanted to leave your house, what would you need to do first? So you can ask these good open-ended questions that are not confrontational, but are definitely trying to clarify. Yeah? Uh, so are we doing intakes for families or for individuals? Individuals, okay. And so if there's multiple individuals that are having multiple Um, and the same thing with the next question, it's a compound, break it up. Um, something here is you can, you may have in your head, okay, do you need assistance? And they start telling you about how they don't have this and you're like, oh my gosh, I know the place to go. Let me give you the card to Community Action House. Um, staff, is that an okay thing for them to in the interview or would you rather them route that to staff members? So there we go. That's the if answer. If you get to this question, we're going to go over this um, in the in the breakout sessions. But if you get to this question and you're identifying specific needs, write those down because there will be a team of attorneys, including me, who will be reviewing this. And so, if you say to yourself, like, "Hey, this looks like it might be a good referral for a community action house, or referral for a good Sam, whatever," you can note that here. That's going to be helpful for the the legal team. Um, but we don't want you yourselves making those referrals just because that's, that wouldn't be your role. That would be case manager role. Excellent. I asked these questions to see, I don't know all the answers either, but we're going to get them answered together. Um, last slide. I have called this the weight of witness, which I know is a very fancy title, but um, 
one for the people we're working with, one for yourself. Remain calm and avoid expressing feelings such as horror, anger, or pity during the interview. Um, you may hear some difficult things, right? People may spontaneously share. That may happen. Um, that can happen for a lot of different reasons, but if someone is sharing things that are actually horrifying, you as a human person are allowed to feel horrified about that. But in the same way that we talked about greeting someone over enthusiastically can be overwhelming, um, it can, if you are having a strong emotional reaction, that can actually take the focus off of the person you're interviewing and they may become concerned about managing your reactions, which is not what we want. Um, so staying stone-faced while someone tells you something terrible may make them feel unheard or disbelieved. Um, that's not really what we want either. So, I mean, we're, we're all experienced people out here living as humans, knowing how to interact. But being thoughtful of, I am going to let my body show that I hear you, I believe you, this was a hard thing that you went through without saying that's the worst thing I've ever heard. Or I can't believe you, you made it through that I could never have survived. Like that's not actually helpful. Um, it's not always helpful broadly speaking, but certainly not in this interview setting. Um, so last thing, plan for your own emotional care as you do this work. You may hear some heavy things and um, you're not going to get the sort of catharsis of getting to walk with people on their journeys and see where they end up and be able to help in long-term ways. You're just going to kind of hear it and then you may never have a conversation with them again. And that's like tough. Human brains are wired so that when we are hearing and caring about other people's pain, like our pain centers are also lighting up in our brain. That's just how it works. Um, and so when you're hearing about this, it it can weigh on you. So just be thoughtful about what is your care plan for yourself as you move forward out of this process.